because I always get asked, uh, you know, I always, uh, people always say, well, who should I go to work for when I get out? And I've got a very simple answer. We, we may elaborate more on this as we go along, but, uh, you know, the, the real thing to do is to get going in for some institution or individual that you admire. I mean, it's crazy to take in between jobs just because they look good on your resume or because you get a little higher starting pay. I, I was up at Harvard a while back and a very nice young guy picked me up at the airport, uh, Harvard Business School attendee, and he said, look, he said, I went to undergrad here and then I worked for X and Y and Z and now I've come here. And he said, I, I thought it would really round up my resume perfectly if I went to work now for a big management consulting firm. And I said, well, is that what you want to do? And he said, no, but he said, that's the perfect resume. And I said, well, when are you going to start doing what you like? And he said, well, I'll get to that someday. And I, I said, well, you know, I said, your plan sounds to me a lot like saving up sex for your old age. You know, I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> but, uh, I told that same group, I said, you know, go to work for whomever you admire the most. And I said, you can't get a bad result. You'll jump out of bed in the morning and you'll be having fun. And Dean called me up a couple weeks later. He said, what'd you tell those kids? He said, they're all becoming self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got you've to temper that advice a little bit. Uh, uh, the, the, in many areas, small businesses have an advantage. You know, in other businesses, scale has a huge advantage. And I mean... You don't want to be a, a tiny carbon steel producer. On the other hand, when mini mills came along and learned how to use scrap more effectively than, than the, the, the older methods of making steel, they actually had an advantage. So scale is a huge advantage in some businesses. It's, you know, the largest airlines haven't won. Southwest Airlines has won, starting with, you know, just a few planes flying down there between Houston and Dallas. And, and they have become bigger but their ambition hasn't been to be the biggest. And, uh, you know, they, they probably buy their fuel just as cheap as United, and they probably bought it, you know, when they're a lot smaller. Walmart is a classic example. I mean, who would have thought 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I mean, here was Sears with a 100-story-plus building in Chicago, had access to money far cheaper than Sam Walton. I mean, Sam Walton's credit was not as good as Sears. Every supplier wanted to do business with Sears. Nobody had ever heard of Sam. Every real estate developer who was developing a new shopping center went first to Sears, you know, and Sam got the short end. So here's a guy starting in Bentonville, Arkansas, and he kills him over time. Just plain kills him. And disadvantage in buying, disadvantage in borrowing, disadvantage in real estate. Advantage, Sam Walton and his ability to inspire, in the end, hundreds of thousands of people to be enthusiastic about going to work and doing, all the, doing the right things over time. So, I would be just as optimistic about small business generally. Now, there's certain areas uh, where scale just is, is just plain important, but, but I see no disadvantage. We intentionally at Berkshire, we have 112,000 employees, more in Georgia than in any other state in the union, incidentally. Uh, uh, we employ a lot of near Dalton, and we employ a lot of people in Macon at Geico. And, we intentionally, with our 112,000 employees, we probably have, I don't know how many business units, but lots. And we only have 13.8 people at headquarters. I'm not the .8, incidentally. I <laughs> resent it when people think that. I, I'm a full, but we have one woman that works four days a week. And that's all we have at headquarters, 112,000 people. 105 billion a market cap. But we intentionally keep our units small. We think, we, we want them to have the nimbleness the responsiveness to the customer particularly, that will turn them, you know, that essentially will more than offset anything that the scale of having maybe a little more purchasing power or something will, uh, will develop. We own a home furnishing, we have furniture, home furnishings business in Utah run by a fellow named Bill Child. He was featured in Fortune about one issue ago. Uh, the, it, the, the cover story was God in business. It was, and it was, Bill was the number one illustration. Bill took that business from his father-in-law when it was doing $250,000 a year. And he now has over half the business in Utah in his field, about four, close to 400 million. He built it by thinking about the customer. And the truth was, he was competing with Sears, he was competing uh, with Levitz, was a huge furniture re retailer in the past. He was competing with everybody. But all he thought about from the moment he got up in the morning was, how do I take care of my customer? And that wins. We have a business in Omaha some of you may have heard of 
it's the largest home furnishing store in the world. In Omaha, which only has a SMSA of 650,000 people, it's on 72 acres. It does $325 million in one location, which happens to be $500 for every man, woman, and child on the SMSA, but it draws from beyond that. That business comes about, or has resulted, from an investment of $500 in 1937 by a woman who walked out of Russia in 1921. She, landed, she walked out, got on a peanut boat, landed in Seattle with a tag around her neck. She couldn't speak one word of English. The American Red Cross looked at the tag. It said Fort Dodge, Iowa. They got her to Fort Dodge, Iowa. She couldn't pick up the language. She was there two years. She said she felt like a dummy. So she came to Omaha because there were other Russian Jews there and she'd at least have somebody to talk to. Her little girl started school, Francis. Francis would come home at night and teach her mother the words she learned in school that day. That's how this woman, Rose Blumpkin, learned the English language, but from her, from her daughter from kindergarten on, teaching her the words. She brought seven siblings over from Russia, one at a time, 50 bucks. Every time she saved 50 bucks, she sold used clothing and other works. She got her seven siblings over, her mother and father, and by 1937, 16 years after she got here, she saved $500. She got on a train, went to Chicago, to the American Furniture Mart, which was this huge, impressive thing. She had this, she was smart as hell, but she thought like a peasant in a way, and she saw this building and she decided to name her company the Nebraska Furniture Mart. She went in and bought $500 worth of, uh, she bought about $2,000 worth of uh, <coughs> merchandise. All the way back to Omaha, she worried because she thought, I owe $1,500, and she only had a $500 equity. So she got to Omaha. She took the bed, the sofa, the refrigerator out of her own home to sell fast so she could get the money so she could pay on time. She took that business and built it from that start. No one would sell to her. She went into court four times because they tried to the carpet manufacturers tried to keep her from selling at a discount, and she went into court and told the judge, because she figured out ways to buy this stuff in various nefarious ways from other, had other people buy it for her, and she said, look at, I pay $3 a yard for this carpet, Brandeis sells it for $6.98, she says, I sell it for $3.98, just tell me, judge, how much you want me to rob people. She defended herself, papers wrote it up, the judge bought carpet from her the next day, I mean, it was, it was marvelous. <laughs> Brandeis isn't selling anymore. They were the huge department store in Omaha. She put everybody out of business. And the punchline, she worked till she was 103. She sold me the business when she was 89. And she didn't have, she didn't have an audit. I went out to see her uh, one afternoon. I took a check out with me and I, and because I knew she wanted to do something. And I said, Mrs. B, here's the money. I said, I don't need an audit. Just tell me whether you owe any money. She said, I've never owed any money since I owed those guys back in 1937. And she said, it's all free and clear. She'd never seen a balance sheet. She didn't know what accounting terms meant, but she understood the nature of the business. And I told her, I said, I'd rather have, I'd rather have your word, you know, than an audit from every one of the big six or big eight or whatever there were the number at the time of the top auditing firms. And, and she worked till she was 103. She died at 104. She had three siblings at her funeral. I mean, those are some genes. Her son works there now. He's 82 or three, and the three sisters are all alive. But the punchline is she couldn't read or write. This woman could not read or write. If you told her this room was 68 feet by 43, she would tell you how many square yards it was like that. She never went to school a day in her life. She would tell you how, how much that was at 598 a yard. She'd add the tax. She'd knock off something because she liked your looks. And that would be it. And that, that's, you know, that is the, the, that, you can't beat that, you know. And, and you can't replicate that at General Motors. You can't institutionalize that. The, the person who brings that kind of drive to a business and does it day after day and thinks about their customer, uh, and that's all she did. Can't, and well, she raised four kids in the process too, but you can't, it, it can't miss. And no, you don't have to worry if you're an entrepreneur in most fields. There are some fields where you can't do it because there are scale aspects to it. But in most fields, you know, you'll, you'll kill people. Bob Shaw did that with, with Shaw. Nobody ever heard of Shaw in carpet 30 years ago. And he's got 40% of the carpet business in the country. To, 
so don't I, it, it, it's a great field of opportunity out there and I had uh, uh, I don't know about trucking specifically but I wish you the best on it and you're you won't be at a disadvantage in many fields if, if you're small and you'll actually have an advantage